So, so we're, we're gonna finish up these lectures today. So, so my, my, well, it, it'll be a little bit less heavy handed than yesterday. So, so um, I mean, you know, from, from, from a nicer point of view, it would have been good to switch the two lectures, but I kind of wanted you to see one thing before I did it at the end of today. Because even if you kind of only vaguely understood the neck region structures, I mean, I can at least uh, pull back to something so we can sort of discuss morally what's gonna be happening. So what I want to do today is discuss a little bit the proof of Reifenberg itself. This is where I'm going to start. Um, even just the classical case. And for that matter, just for the classical case, uh, what I'm going to do first, actually, is simply uh, write down again this example that, that, that we were discussing the first couple days. And we'll prove it carefully there that we actually have a byholder equivalence between the, 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 this wiggling example and uh, the, uh, in an interval. Uh, but we're gonna do this not the way I kind of outlined it on the first day, we're, we're gonna do this in a somewhat different way because uh, I'm gonna do it in a way where literally once we build the right structures, the proof of the classical Reifenberg will be verbatim with the verbatim estimates. It will be no different. So, so, so we'll get to ni seeing a nice clean example how to actually, uh, you know, how this looks and what it looks like and then we can wave our hands through through what constructions are missing in the general case. So let's, let's begin by recalling what this example looks like. So what we did was the following. So we had our, our start with an interval, and I did it from minus two to two. I really don't know why I picked two offhand. I did that so long ago, and I've been writing with it for a while. I'm just kind of stuck with it. Um, and this is what we called our sort of S naught. And we started to build a sequence of guys, right? And the first thing we did was we said, okay, we're gonna fix some background epsilon. And for us here, it's just some fixed background something. We're gonna build an isosceles triangle. Say this guy goes up. So, so if the length of this guy is the length of the single interval that sort of connects from, from minus two to two, of course, that's four. Then this guy here is supposed to be epsilon times the length uh, of the interval of the, the, the opposite side. And that was S1 which was itself a union of two intervals, right? So S1 was a uh, union of, in general, SI, right, was a union of L, A, I, J, and A, I, J plus one. We'll recall by definition these were points in R2, and this was the segment connecting the two points by definition. Um, <clears throat> and then the next step was that, okay, now, now we start to alternate. We went down by epsilon times the length of whatever each of these intervals are. And then we went up for the next guy, and this built us our nice S2, I guess, right? S0, S1, S2, and so forth and so, uh, so on. I mean, we kept alternating like this. And what you get out of this construction is a nice sort of Reifenberg uh, set in the end, and we sort of su suggested why this, this thing was actually biholder to an interval. And what I'd like to see is a little bit more carefully how we can construct this map um, to see that this thing is biholder to, to the unit interval. And the way I want to do it now is, is the following. So the way I'd suggested before, recall, was that in the one-dimensional case, we can cheat and say that even though the, the, the lengths of all these things are going to infinity, um, we can parameterize each of them by arc length and try to just start keeping track of what's happening with, with those mappings. But this is not at all how I want to do this. Um, instead, what I want to do the f is the following. Let me make sure I have all my information recorded. So, so recall from our notation before, so our SI was our piecewise linear guy, and the length of all these guys was the same, right? Because we always uh, cut it up, and their length was, because I'll want this down for later. The length of any interval in the ith segments was, what, so four was the original one, and then every time it was what happened, right? It was the, uh, the square root of one plus epsilon squared over two, and then we multiply by i each time, right? Because what happens, we, we half the length, and then we came out and did a nice little Pythagorean theorem. Okay, now, here's how I wanna build the mapping. Um, so, so here's our S0, here's our S1, here's our S2. Um, note, note the following, and let me just actually draw the first two steps. Or one can view this as being any step somewhere in the middle. Maybe this is one of our Li, so this becomes Li plus one of length Li plus one, right? Then I wanna look at the projection map, pi 
with my notation i, from si plus one into si. So, so there's a nice orthogonal projection here, right? So, so I can take any point here and look at the closest point, it just sort of bump projected, look at the closest point projection down, right? So, so if I'm here, that's literally just there. If I'm here, I'm literally just there. And I want to build a map, but what I want to do is make the following sort of interesting observation. Um, we're trying to eventually build a, a mapping from, let's just say, some SI. Um, I want uniform estimates on any I so I can pass it to the limit to get our wild sets into an interval. And what's one way of identifying the interval? The interval was actually our original S0. I like um, that that observation is sort of silly sounding but quite useful because I'm going to try to build a mapping from SI and to the interval S0 by composing these guys. Right, so the goal is the following. I'm going to let, what's my notation? Those pi's look exactly the same, I need different notation. Let's do phi. On the right up it's lowercase and up a little bit, who can tell here? I'm going to get a mapping from SI, so after we wiggle you know, on the scale 2 to the minus i, roughly speaking, into the interval, which is just S0, so minus 2 to 2, by just composing. Pi 1. Good. And the goal is to, that, that to show that this mapping is going to be uniformly by holder, independent of i. Right, right. So in the end, when we take our same limits to get our crazy set s, we can just limit these maps right along with it. So, so we want to get some nice estimates on this guy here. OK, so, so in order to do that, all I want actually are two dumb observations. Right, right? And we're just going to play with these observations over and over again. So if we look at this mapping here, right, which maps SI plus 1 to SI, it always looks like this, right? I mean, you've always got some interval on, S, on SI, and then that's connected by two intervals in SI plus 1. And therefore, the projection map from, from, from SI plus 1 to SI is you just look at that interval and you plop it down, right? So, so if you look at that, this tells you two things right away. So let's call these estimates 1. Um, pi i of x minus pi i of y, on the one hand, is actually precisely equal in this case, but you can think less than or equal to for the context of the standard Reifenberg, obviously. The square root of 1 plus epsilon squared times x minus y. So, so why is that? I mean, note if I take two points, even if they're far away here, right? I have a point x here and a point y over here, then the, the, well, 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 what's the, the by Lipschitz constant of this mapping? If I take a unit curve here, then, then it always, or let's, yeah, we're not here. If I take a unit curve here, then, then, then it always, its length gets divided by the square root of 1 plus epsilon squared here, right? So if I take my unit curve connecting these two to get the length, then they just get projected right in there. And we actually get the, the precise equality up here. So that is to say, these maps are by Lipschitz, right? No by holder. Right? There's a uniform by Lipschitz constant. If I only move one step, right? You can't induct on that, obviously. If I tried to use that forever, you'd never get anything about your end map, because all you'd be saying is, you know, after you do i steps to get down here, you'd have a by Lipschitz constant that's 1 plus epsilon squared to the i, which is useless information, right? So clearly, we need more than this, but this, this is one thing we'll use. It holds for all x and y. Well, OK, one should be a little careful about this. You're right. Um, if I'm using the intrinsic metric, it's equality. If I'm using actually Euclidean, which is, of course, what I'm doing, well, let, let, let's say that. It's actually less than or equal. I do not. I mean, I, I mean one step, exactly. Yes. Because if this was true for capital phi, not only would we have by holder, we'd have by Lipschitz. Right, right? So, so we definitely don't have by Lipschitz. So just one step, nothing goes too wrong. We have a nice by Lipschitz map. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is the following. So what if I take some point, and I just take it here, and I project it down, and I look how far does that point get moved? 
um, in total. Now that point gets moved basically epsilon times the, the, the length of your side, right? Because that's, that's the most distance it can be. So, so this is bounded by, or we can say bounded by, epsilon times the, the length of Li. Now the, the longer the two sides, doesn't really matter. That's the farthest it can move is epsilon times this length right here, because by definition, that there was eps, epsilon times Li. Everything else is less. Again, that's just one step, one movement. Okay, good. So, so the claim now, though, is that, okay, so by Lipschitz for one step, not moving very much for one step, actually, if you combine these two in a clever enough fashion, that's by Holder. That's the claim. Right, so th th this is worth absorbing a little bit, because th th this is the, you know, how does one prove by Holder estimates? This, this is how one tries to prove by Holder estimates. So, so the way it's going to work is the following. So let's take our SI. Actually, let's take three. So here's S0. Our, our eventual goal. Now, let, let's say we're on some SI, which is what we're trying to study here to get our projection map down. So let me just wiggle this around. Who the heck knows what this thing looks like? It's really, really small. Here's our SI. We've wiggled a lot at this point, maybe. Um, and what I want to do is take two points, X and Y, over here. And I want to introduce, so, so we have two scales in front of us, right? We, we have our I, which is where we're at. We have the not, which is where we're heading. And in fact, we have an in-between scale, which is roughly the distance of these two points, right? Which may not be sort of comparable either to Li or L not. So what we want to look at is let's let x minus y be approximately Lj. So let's find the j so that if we look at sj, the amount each segment is moving is roughly on the same order as the distance between x minus y. And the precise way of saying this is just let's find the, the largest j, say, for which this is less than or equal to that. So, so that is more precisely. We can find a j with the following properties. So, so it's, 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 it's less than LJ, but maybe bigger than LJ plus one is the point, right? So we find just that point. Okay, great. And let's look at that guy too. Maybe it looks something like that. Here's our SJ. Okay, now here's what we want to do. We, we want to take these two points in SI, right? We want to move them all the way down to S0. So I'm going to break this into two steps. So, so let's let, let actually, let's define an in-between map here, which is, I'll call it phi ij, that maps SI into SJ, basically by just stopping the composition at some point, right? So, so. Is that J or J plus one? J, great. Ah, that's a zero. And likewise, right, just by switching I and J to the exact same definition, but let's go ahead and point it out. Uh, I can let J naught be defined as uh, J minus one composed all the way down to J naught. Yeah. When you say x minus y, do you mean the previous distance or the differentiation metric that I want to? I'm going to say Euclidean here. I'm going to say Euclidean. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Did I do this backwards? Do I have to compose? What order do I have to compose these in? I'm sorry. My left and right are totally off. Right. You got to do this map first, and then you end with this map. You got to do this map first, and then you end with this map. We really need to write compositions the other direction. You think about moving in that direction, unless you're Chinese, right? And so, so you think about moving that way, and it's actually moving this way, right? So I think I confused everybody except our Chinese students. 
Okay, great. So then what I want to do now is simply write phi i as being the composition of these two guys. Let's make sure I do this one right. So that would be phi j naught composed with phi ij. OK, great. Um, yes. So, so OK, goal is have a picture for what these estimates are supposed to look like. So, so my basic claim is that we're going to use one of these to control one of these maps and the other one to control the other map, right? right? So we can try to end up with our, with our biholder. So in some sense, j here, right, basically just depends on the distance between x and y. So, so what we don't want to do, just to get a hint of sort of, you know, what we might expect to be doing here, um, what we don't want to do is pl apply this infinitely often, right? So in fact, we're going to be applying this to this map where we know we're only applying it a certain number of times based on the distance apart. That, that, that's almost uh, the, the moral of what uniform continuity is. And if we check uh, the actual constants, this is what by holder will be for us in the end. And what we can apply infinitely often is this, because if we're applying this guy for, for all k in between i and j, it's like a geometric series. It's going to end up not being that big of a deal to apply it infinitely often. So, so this, this is what we want to think about. So let me talk about this map first for just a second. So let's, let's write a goal, goal one. Um, I want to show, so I'm, I'm interested in looking at, at right, so, so what are we trying to show? Let's do our series of goals that each keep getting more and more refined. So our map was defined here, right? So let's just say, let's show one direction of the byholder estimate, and the other is verbatim. Gotta, Hold on to this board before it jumps away. So I want to show there's a beta, and we're going to be able to take this beta explicitly, and it'll go to 1 as epsilon goes to 0, so that phi i of x minus phi i of y is bounded by something small. I don't care. Something close to 1. I don't care. Um, times the distance of x and y to the power beta. Right. So this is our ultimate goal of what we want to show. Um, I, I want to start with sort of a, a, a weaker goal over here for this map. Basically, I want to say this map actually doesn't move a fixed point very much relative to the distance of x and y. C for me, by the way, always basically means some universal constant here, because it's all one dimensional. If you were doing standard right from Berg, it would mean a dimensional constant. The same for Y. So my first claim, right, is that this map basically doesn't matter. Right, right. When we do end estimates here, the amount that's going to move the point x is going to be small relative to the distance in x and y anyway. So, so in the end, it won't count for anything in terms of bad estimates. Right? So th this is going to be a good thing because this one definitely will count for bad stuff in the end. So we want to see nothing moves much. And how do we see this? Um, so, so, so. Let's just do it inductively. So let's let xk be phi of i k of x. So, so I want k here to go from i to, so, so phi i i is just x itself, right? Nothing's happened. And then I want k to go from i to j. And all I want to do is, is the absolute dumbest thing possible, which is to estimate. So I want to estimate x sub j. I, I know that i i is x. I'm just going to do a stupid triangle inequality to try to sum up all those distances in between. This is going to be the goal. And here we're going to use this estimate here. I 
which is going to be less than or equal to epsilon times LK, I guess, or K plus 1, I don't care. Um, and LK itself, well, I don't care about LK, I care about LJ, right? LJ is the distance between X and Y by definition, essentially, right? So, so if, I, if I compare this, so K is going to be um, potentially much smaller than, than, than much bigger than, than, than J. So this is going to be much smaller than L sub J. And the, the, the amount smaller it'll be is, I mean, this is equals epsilon times square root of 1 plus epsilon squared over 2 say, to the j minus i, right? It's big. Lj. So in other words, this is something summable is all you care about, right? If k is going to be a, a yes, that's, that's less than 1. So, so if k is going to be less than j, right, this sums does like 2, right, as we move on, or something a little bit bigger than 1. Which means that if we wanted to prove this, that v i j of x minus x. This is less than or equal to the sum by just sort of definition of what these things are, right? Of, I'm likely going to get all my i's and j's messed up here. So I can do this silly thing where I, I can just sort of add and subtract in all, all the in-between steps and just do a triangle inequality, plug all these guys in. They're all epsilon times l sub j, but something summable, right? right? So, so what I get is, C, which is maybe 2 even, one can compute, times L sub J. And this is like X minus Y. So, so I mean, as claimed below, well, once you start wiggling more than the distance between them, you don't care. Things don't move around much. So this map ends up not counting for much. I've got five pictures, I can erase one. So what have we done? We've taken our, our point on, let's not draw it that way, let's draw it this way. So they don't look, I don't know why I'm intersecting the two, I shouldn't be. Here's why, right? So I've got my two points on, on SI. And I've now projected them up to SJ, and nothing much has changed, right? They've moved here. So here's my phi ij of x. And this has moved over here somewhere. I mean, it's bounced around, but it's gotten up around here. My phi ij of y. So comparing these two distances is, is now basically equivalent to comparing these two distances. It doesn't matter. Okay, so, so now how do I finish the game and, and prove this? So let's just look at this for a second. Sorry about the two lines. Um, so by definition, right, I mean, I, the phi i, which is the composition of all those maps, I can get it by first doing the first uh, i minus j of them and then doing the last j of them. And this, this is the map we just studied to get from here to here. Now, what do we know about, about this mapping here in each of these? Well, this thing guy here is a, comp is a composition of j uh, of our single projection maps from, from point to point. If we look at this estimate up here, we know the distance. Every time we do this, the distance multiplies by a factor, some factor that's close to 1, right? And it'll at most now multiply by this guy j times. So in fact, all this guy does is multiply distances by at most the square root of 1 plus epsilon squared to the power j. 
right? So this is less than or equal to one plus epsilon squared to the j over two times the original distance uh, of these two points, the ij of x minus phi ij of y. Okay. Now, phi ij of x and phi ij of y, what do we know about them? This hasn't moved x by more than some small factor times the distance. This hasn't moved y by more than some small factor times this distance. So this here is less than or equal to, in fact, maybe I'll, let me just do it for you. I'll do it over here so I don't have to mess up my computation. So what happens when we do this twice? I mean, that picture should be telling you the answer. So how far away is phi ij of x minus phi ij of y in comparison to x minus y? Well, I'll just do a triangle inequality. Let's bound this by by, I have a small blackboard, I'm afraid. Um, the sum of that minus that plus that minus that, and you can do this by a triangle inequality. So it's just twice this, right? So this is another c, I don't care. I'm an analyst, my c is never the same from line to line. So this is also just bounded by by c epsilon times x minus y, which is to say this distance is up to one plus c epsilon, the same as this distance. because this didn't move x much and this didn't move y much relative to the distance of x and y. That's why we chose to scale j. Okay, um, now what? Uh, all, all we actually really have to do at this point is fiddle around with, with the definition of this and w w what this is for a minute. So let's just write like four lines and we'll have our beholder estimate. We don't have to erase another board. I guess that one's gonna go. So this is so remember the definition of x minus y was that it was roughly equivalent to lj, in particular less than or equal to lj. So let me put that back in. I'm basically gonna turn this into lj, manipulate all my j's, and turn them back into x minus y, just because we can see it cleaner that way. And let me stick straight in the definition of, of lj. So this is bounded by lj, which is itself precisely equal to what? Square root of one plus epsilon squared, that looks familiar, over two to the power of j. This is equal to one plus c epsilon. I just wanna to collect together my two square root of one plus epsilon squared, because why not? The j. And now, now here where sort of the, the, the nifty definition comes from. So, so let's define, let's make sure I do this right. Oh, sorry, here, there's actually a, a four here, right? When I put in the definition of L sub J, it's four times this, it doesn't matter. It gets absorbed right back in, just by definition it's four times that, because I start on the on interval of length four and then I keep multiplying by this. This is gonna be equal, now equal, mind you, so I'm gonna be giving you a definition in one second. I don't like, this one plus epsilon squared. I prefer square root of one plus epsilon squared because that gets me back to LJ. So what I'm gonna do is simply write this as being the square root of one plus epsilon squared over two to the power beta. And, and let's observe something, right? So, so um, this is less than one, right? So, so this is a little bit bigger than this is, right? but this is less than one, which means I need to raise to a power that's a little bit less than one. Right, so beta is less than one here. I mean, this equality here is my definition of beta. Right? It's less than one, but clearly as epsilon goes to zero, beta goes to one. Okay. 
What's that? Is that any how uh, I and J This? Yeah, this, th th this line here only holds, though, um, when, when the distance between x minus y is equivalent to L sub j, right? That was the point. So, so this distance here ended up being, so you, you got this line here, right, which is always true, but that only became x minus y on this level. So I can't let j go to zero. That's the point. I can only do that when the wiggling is more than the distance, is less than the distance between x and, and y. That's the point. Okay, wait, where am I? I'm over here. I just want to switch beta and j. Well, yes, I don't care, I don't do, do either. Um, so th this is, beta. and then I want to do a less than or equal to so I can shove a beta here. Um, and then I'll just, I'll rewrite it because I don't want to do too much in one line. Two, I'm going to stick a, a beta there and a j there. I'm just gonna switch beta and j. And then, so all I did was raise this to a power so I could absorb this into here now. One plus c epsilon times four times the square root of one plus epsilon squared over two to the j to the beta. And this is L sub j by definition, right? So, so we can get back to that. Uh, I might have to make this a little bit bigger. I, I didn't actually keep track of which one made it less than or equal to. This is a little bit less than one, which actually makes this a little bit smaller, but only by an amount that's very, very close to one. Right? So I made this C worse. <laughs> that's how I made it less than or equal to. L sub j to the beta. And now one more time, we turn that to x minus y, and we're done. And the way I'm doing this, I guess I'm going to shove a factor that's close to two, you can actually be more careful in that, but I don't care. So, so two, whatever, times, and I may as well just drop the one plus the epsilon if I'm gonna put two there. L sub j, x minus y to the beta. Right? The two was because of this guy here. You can be more careful than that, but I didn't. Um, that's it, right? So, so starting up here, it's saying we have a, a, a holder condition on how these are, and the opposite direction is basically exactly the same. Right? You just gotta trace the inequalities the other direction. So, um, good. So, so, what's aggravating about this is that it's aggravating. However, it is a comparatively simple situation, right? You sit down for two hours and this, this becomes clear. It, it's, it's just a projection from line to line to line to line, and you trace through. The clever point you really want to keep track of here is that when you're doing your estimate, you cannot, you've got to have both these guys. If you do this too much, you lose all control. If you do this too much, well, actually, you might be able to preserve like Grom of Hal or Hausdorff close, but you'll never get a bi-holder condition, right? So, so you, you need to preserve the distance between the two. Okay. Gut.